retirement. Why are we stuck with the word retirement? It's a false goal. If you look in the English Oxford Dictionary for the definition of retirement, you're told it's rest, rest in bed, seclusion, removal from action and danger, and of course, giving up your job or your professional activity. Well, maybe six or seven years after retirement, some 30 years ago, you were dead. But now, we live 30 or 40 years after we retire. Is that going to be lying down? Is it going to be in seclusion? Somehow, the word retirement is synonymous with, I've done it. I'm now going to rest. I'm going to take a break. But even worse, it's also thought that it's good for our health. Well, nothing could be further from the truth. It is not good for our mental or our physical health. I often get quite annoyed when people say to me, I'm going to take the lift, not the stairs, because you know I'm getting old. Why can't we have a new name? Why can't we have a name that indicates that we're vibrant, we're active, we have purposeful activity. So please, could you think about a new name for me? Some two years ago, when I was on holiday, I was browsing in a bookshop. I came across a book about a woman called Claire Booth Luce. She was an American diplomat. When this book was written, she was 80 years of age. Just inside the front cover, this woman said, I will be ambitious until the day I die. When you flick through the pages, you got a sense of a truly vibrant woman who was really living her life. She was still in paid work. She was doing voluntary work. Now contrast that with Mr. Wright. Mr. Wright was a friend and colleague of my father. They both worked in the co-op warehouse. Mr. Wright joined the co-op at 16. He was going to retire at 65. They gave him his gold watch. And I was talking to him over the fence about two weeks after he retired. I said, Mr. Wright, what are you going to do? He looked rather soulful and down. And then, almost in tears, he said to me, I have no job. I am waiting to die. I was 16. Of course, I thought I was immortal. I was really more concerned about my O-levels than Mr. Wright and his problems. I wasn't really very sympathetic. Mr. Wright was dead by 70. He had no purposeful work. He had nothing to live for. Now, work is defined in the dictionary as purposeful activity. It could be paid, it could be unpaid. It might be full or part-time or self-employment. You might be caring for someone. You may be a homemaker bringing up a family. You may be doing voluntary activities. All of these things are social good and individual good. They are purposeful activity. I want that work to be good work. I'm not talking about bad work, and there is quite a lot of bad work around. I'm talking about work where you feel valued where you're listened to, where you're given a sense of control. So I have to tell you about my underground train driver. This was when I was National Director for Health and Work, and I thought that some people had very boring jobs. So I said, can I go and join someone who's driving an underground train? So I joined my driver at Baker Street Tube Station. It was the early shift, 5 a.m. in the morning, we sat together in his little cabin. 
Well, I got pretty bored. Um, we went up and down the Bakerloo line. So I said, you know, could we do the Jubilee line? <laughs> and, and this is an awfully early shift. And wouldn't it be good for your family if you could have the afternoon shift? And then I said, of course, if your employer was a good employer, you could have a week above ground at the barriers talking to people, and then three weeks underground in this really dark tunnel. Well, he was very happy to drop me off. <laughs> but when he dropped me off, what he did, it was wonderful. He banged on his wheel and said, looking fairly cross with me, this is my train. Nothing <coughs> happens here but that I give the orders. I'm responsible for the safety of the people behind me. I've got good mates. I don't want the Metropolitan Line. <laughs> I, I don't want a later shift. We've got good occupational health. I'm reasonably well paid, more or less, he was saying, go away. Now, I thought my train driver would be in that job until he was in his 60s, until he was going to retire. But then what? Had we thought about him having new skills? Did he have an educational need? Or was he going to sit, lie down, and shrivel? This was a man with purposeful activity. Now, for most of you in the audience, this will not be a problem. You will have thought about this transition period and what can happen afterwards. But there are thousands and thousands of people out there who are not in the sort of jobs where they have thought about this. I believe if someone is mentally and physically able, if they have aspirations, if they have hidden ambitions, they should be able to do this at whatever time of life they are. Indeed, encouraging my train driver to slow down, to sit down, take more rest, is actually bad for his health. Just to concentrate on one part of health, just let us think about physical activity. We now know that physical activity is very related strongly correlated to your overall health. In fact, it's bad for you to really just rest and sleep and do nothing else. And we now know there is a medical condition called frailty. If you're frail, you sit more. When you walk, you walk far more slowly. Your grip strength gets worse you feel exhausted, and you lose weight. Now, that condition of frailty, you might think, happens, oh, well, after when you're 80. But let me tell you, there is good evidence now that this happens to people in their 50s and their 60s, and it is correlated with your ability to be in work. So we don't want to be encouraging people to do too much sitting. Which brings me to my story from this summer. I was on holiday in Spain, on a walking holiday, um, and it had been rather wet and damp. We were coming down the mountain, and I fell, and I fractured my left leg. Fortunately, just the small bone in my left leg, I was put in a nice boot uh, with a, a rocker, and I could walk pretty fast. But all my friends were highly protective. Carol, I think you should sit down. Let us make you a cup of tea. It would really be better if you had a car to go there. And then one friend said, well, why don't you take two months off work? It'll help you recover. As if just resting was going to help me recover. Indeed, the opposite is true. If you want a bone to heal, you have to give it some messages. You have to give it a little bit of tension. 
So walking was very good for me. And I did walk. And two weeks after my um, accident, then I was able to join in the Cambridge Chariots of Fire race. I just did fast walking. <laughs> now, I'm really pleased to say that a light bulb has gone on in Whitehall. The government really gets this connection and is concerned about it. So just before Christmas, there was a very good report published which linked active ageing to our musculoskeletal system and being physically active with some pretty good advice about what we might do. And I'm really delighted that our charities, for example, Age Concern, are right behind this movement. But what would I like to eliminate from the way we think about and indeed treat older people? Well, I want to eliminate our being overprotective. You know what we say is, well, you might trip or fall if you go out. You might break your leg. So why not sit at home? We make them less self-confident. They know that their balance isn't as good. We all know our balance isn't as good as we get older. But rather than be hugely protective, so they don't go and meet their friends for coffee, they don't go to the church hall to have afternoon tea. They don't go and do their shopping. Why don't we help them do things that improve their balance? You can clean your teeth standing on one foot. Um, that's very good for your balance. And surely it is for the social good. And indeed, it would cost less money if we concentrated on being positive rather than leaving people in their homes secluded. And if you're secluded, you become lonely. And I don't need to tell you that loneliness is now a national disease. The other thing I really get upset about is going into a care home. Now, some care homes are very good, but I've been into too many when you go in and you see people just sitting all around the room. They're not talking to each other. Some of them are just looking straight ahead. Some are looking at the television. But there's no purposeful activity. Now, why aren't they on the floor doing a movement class? Why aren't they going out for a walk? Or what about a bit of yoga or some Pilates? Why isn't there some purpose? Now, my own life has had many episodes of purposeful activity, and many of them have been after the age of 50. Indeed, many of the best things have been after the age of 50. I would describe myself as a late developer. <laughs> I became National Director for Health and Work at the age of 66 and had a wonderful challenge. But earlier in my life, I didn't have enough confidence. I wasn't a good enough risk taker. There were periods when I was pretty static. But things did develop after the age of 50. And I talked about this when I did Desert Island Discs. And I was immensely moved by the number of people who either wrote me emails or letters and told me their stories. Their stories of how they wanted to do things after 50 and 60, their aspirations, their ambitions, their hopes. It was truly moving. Just to give you an example of a really good uh, message that I received was from a woman who said, well, my husband had a very good career, and he's thinking of taking early retirement. I took some time off with the children, got a part-time job, then a full-time job, and now it's my time. I want a career. I might live to be 100. So I told him, I'm just starting. <laughs> we often inside do not feel confident when we go for jobs at this age. 
will they regard me as old, incapable, not mature? Will I be resilient enough? Why can't they see us as experienced, capable people who will do the job? Surely, that should be possible. I'm going to be flippant for a moment, because I want to talk about clothes and shoes. <laughs> now, when you get to my age, should you want to buy fashionable clothes? I can tell you it's difficult. What they would like to do is to put us into rather long skirts. The colours are often drab, and there's a lot of sort of pale floral colours. And it gets worse when you want a pair of jeans. Really, you shouldn't be wanting jeans at this age. <laughs> what about shoes? I can't wear those very big heels, but I could wear elegant pumps with a heel that is suitable for me feeling a really competent woman at the age I am. Why do these retailers not see us as a market? Why are we not encouraged to go into those shops like the young? I wish that that could happen. So I've talked to you about retirement. I've talked to you about how it's defined that you will sit, that you will lie down, that you'll be secluded, removed from the world. I don't want that. I want anyone and everyone of that age to feel that they have purpose and that they can live life to the full. You often feel there is a deadness of living. I hope to be ambitious until the day I die. I will not be part of the living dead. <laughs>